Oh, look at this. Look at the cable cars and all the trains and the sidings. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video of this series, Code With Me. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at preview features in 4.0 and show you some of the ways that I code, and so you can follow along if you want to, and basically show off some new and exciting features that will come to 4.0. So for today's video, I'm going to be adding some features that some people suggested that you might have forgotten about. First, this feature is going to surprise Cherbert, who is the creator of the Linden Underground add-on. Okay, so anyway, I'm back into my code in IntelliJ, and this feature is going to be train... What is it called? Train wobbling? Train... Like, you know when the vehicle kind of moves fast, and then it kind of shakes and sways a little bit? I guess you can call it swaying, yeah. Vehicle swaying. So, I am in my render vehicles class and I need to kind of decide how I'm going to approach it. I think the amount the train sway should be proportional to the speed of the train because you're not going to get like big swaying movements when the train is barely moving. That wouldn't make sense. So I think first of all I should create a static method, maybe a private static method to kind of describe what the motion would be like. So I think right here should be okay. So I'm gonna make a static method that describes the pitch of which the train will be moving. Or no, that's called the roll. So the roll, so the yaw is the y-axis movement, rotation. The pitch is the x-axis movement and the roll is the z-axis movement. Okay, so... I guess get roll. So... I've also done a little bit of research. And in physics, this is called harmonic oscillation. Damped harmonic oscillation, I guess. And so, a lot of these results I'm seeing describes the motion as an exponential function with a sine graph. Yeah, so the decay is described by this exponential curve and the movement itself is the sinusoidal movement. So this will be our angle that the train will tilt and then the damping would be the movement getting less and less over time. So back in our code, this is going to be a little bit trickier as well because it will have to be dependent on each car, I suppose. So actually maybe I'm thinking, yeah, I've never done this before. So this is like new kind of coding for me. This is kind of exciting too. So I do have a class already for vehicle extension and persistent vehicle data. So how the code works is that every time a train is updated in the world by the server, it overwrites the list of trains currently in the world. However, this persistent vehicle data class or this persistent vehicle data object will get persisted even though that list of vehicles gets overridden. So Minecraft client data stores all the, I guess, client side vehicle data and like stations and stuff. So this vehicle persistent data doesn't get cleared, even though this vehicle's list get cleared whenever we receive something from the server. So this persistent data is a way for us to store some information that will not be erased once we receive updates from the server because the instance of the vehicle will change. Okay, so yeah, scrolling text animation is also stored in this class. So I feel like oscillation data will also be appropriate to be stored here. So it'll probably be, hmm, it should be by car, right? By, 
like as in each car should have its own oscillation. So I'm going to do something like this, where I have an array, and this will be called, I guess, uh, sway, swaying angle. <laughs> I'll make it float because in in the matrix rotations they take floats rather than doubles as arguments. So I'm going to use float for anything angle related. Okay, so the sway angle okay. Okay, so instead of putting a method here, I'm going to delete this first. Going back to this persistent vehicle data, we need something to trigger the swaying first. So like public void sway. This will add the initial momentum to the train. Okay, so... So first we need the amplitude, I guess. That's going to be proportional to the speed, as I mentioned earlier. So when we first push on the train, like when, when we first have the train start swaying, how strong will that be? That's what the amplitude is going to be. Okay, so when we first start, okay. Actually, I think it'll be more helpful to have a separate class here to describe that. I feel like sway is kind of a weird word for code. <laughs> Maybe oscillation. That's okay, we'll just keep it as sway first. Okay, so scrolling Text, yeah, scrolling text is also provided by a separate class. So perhaps I can do the same thing with swaying. Oops, <laughs> almost deleted everything. Sways, sure. Okay, it does look a bit weird. Maybe I just oscillation. Okay, so I'll delete this for now. I feel like I keep making stuff and deleting stuff. I guess that's part of coding. Okay, so we need a value to store the amplitude, and then we need a ticker because every second or millisecond that goes past, we need to animate it and then uh, we need to kick it off, so. so to start. Okay, so that's how we're going to kick it off. And then as the time ticks by, how can we get that value? Okay, so we already have a ticking with the millis elapsed, which is going to be really helpful. So I'm going to just do the sway. Oh, it's called oscillations for each tick. And then we need to pass in the millis elapsed as well. Because that's going to be pretty important to tell us how many milliseconds passed. Okay, so in physics, the amount, the period of oscillation, meaning the frequency of which the body will go back and forth, is going to be dependent on the mass. But since um, there's no easy way to get the mass of a train car to kind of simulate this, so right now I'm just going to hard code something in. Or maybe it can be dependent on the length and width of the train. Maybe that'll be a bit better. 
So the persistent vehicle data, when we obtain the vehicle cars, we will need to store the length and width to create the oscillations. Okay, I'll think about that a little bit later. So for now, I'm just going to hard code, hard code the, hmm, the period. Okay, we also need uh, we also need a value for the time. I guess this can be uh, long. Okay, and then here we're going to do time increment here. And so here we want to reset the time every time we kick off. Wait a minute. Huh. Yeah. I just thought of something. Let me try to show you what I mean in paint. So let's say the vehicle is currently not swaying and then suddenly we want to kick it off and start swaying. So this will be our amplitude and then it's going to damp and go to like basically zero. So at this point when we want to kick off the swaying, we have no guarantee that the time will be exactly at like an intercept. It could very well just start off from here. And then the train motion will be weird because it'll snap from zero to some angle. That's why I thought about resetting that value to zero. However, I think a better solution would be to wait for the time to get to a certain interval. And then we can kick off the swaying. So let's see. So as I said, I'm going to hard code the period first private static long period oh. IntelliJ suggested 10 seconds for a period that's way too long so I would say a period about one second maybe let's give that a try so we need like a scheduled amplitude Here. Let's name this amount so it doesn't have conflict with the other variables. Okay, so start oscillation amount. So when we schedule this amplitude and when the time gets to if time if time mod period equals zero. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, wait, 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 wait. If the time doesn't exactly hit the multiple of the period, then that's not ever going to hit anyway. Like if Millie's elapse is always like, let's say seven, it'll just skip over. So we need to store the time somehow before we increment it. Okay, so if old time mod period is greater than time mod period, this means that it's looping around back to zero. Then amplitude will be equal to scheduled amplitude. And so we have our actual um, amount. I guess let's name this magnitude. And then this will be our amount. So every time time passes, we're going to decrease the amplitude for a little bit and then we're also going to huh 
So, yeah, we're going to decrease the amplitude. Let's say amplitude like that. This is fake code, by the way, because it's exponential, not linear. And we're also going to have the amount described by a sine function. It could be cosine or sine, but it doesn't really matter because we're always going to be starting the period. Actually, it does matter. Yeah, so sine would work because sine starts from zero. Sine zero is zero, while cosine zero is one. So math.sine of time. Yeah, we need time times period. I think I think I have the math right, right? So it's amplitude A times sine BT will give me the amount. I think let's just do let's just make everything double for now. I'm not going to bother with type casting because sine always comes out as double anyway. Okay, so I think this would work. So let's do the dec decrementing at the end so that we can use the full value if we set it. Okay, so I think this will give us an accurate representation of the movement, except that the damping is right now linear. Okay, I've done a little code cleanup. I made a, a new method to get the amount, to fetch the amount, and then I've also fixed the code for the amplitude. So I also added this if statement. When the amplitude gets way too small, we don't really care about the actual value. We'll just set it to zero. So if amplitude is greater than this is like our threshold, we're going to divide by exp means e to the power of something. So e to the power of millis elapsed times the damping value, which in this case, I'm going to set it to this value for now. I think I need to do some testing to see how it actually looks in game. So that would be the new amplitude. So this is divide equals, meaning that amplitude divided by this value will equal the new amplitude. It's kind of like plus equals, but this is divide equals in Java. Okay, so I think this looks good for now. And then we also need something like this to get the oscillation for the car number. So oscillations. This just basically ensures that we won't get an index out of bounds error to force, because this is a list, instead of initializing it right off the bat for how many cars we have, we'll just dynamically add to the list. If we try to fetch a car number that is not in the list yet. So yeah. Okay, so getting oscillation per car. Okay, so let's try putting it in our render vehicles method. So this is quite complex and I'm gonna need to remember where I should put that code because this doesn't natively support that. So when I do render, so when I render something, it's going to take the two bogey positions and calculate the angles of that. So, wow, I need to really dig through my code again to see where I have to put that in. Okay, so we already have our render transformation set for us. Iterate with index. Does this do the calculation? Maybe not. Vehicle properly. Okay, here's calculating vehicle transformations in advance. So, this maybe? So, this is our vehicle properties class. Okay, how am I supposed to find this? Okay, so this is the render vehicle transformation helper class, and I noticed that I put yaw and pitch in here, so I might as well add one for roll. 
So because yaw and pitch here are being calculated by the bogey stuff, and so here when we have the translations, we can apply the y trans or the rotate x, rotate y. Oh, we don't have a rotate z right now. Hmm. Maybe I guess we'll have to eventually. So Y first and then X and then Ooh. This is quite confusing. I guess I'll apply it. Uh roll. Okay. Transform backwards. Wait, I just realized if I do this, then it's going to affect everything. Including the bogies, which I don't really want movement to. Because I just want movement for the train car itself. So maybe this is not the part of the code that I should add this stuff to. Okay, so back in my renders vehicle, render vehicles class, I have this stored matrix transformation that I supply with the render model. So I feel like if I modify this stored matrix transformation and like force in the the role, then maybe I can get this to work. Because see, hmm, what are the usages of this? Lifts and vehicles. Okay, so if I add in like some extra role to it, then yeah, then I can just add it on to this. Transform backwards. Okay, maybe I'll just add it to the end of it here. Rotate. Hmm. Is it Z or? Let's just try it. No harm to that. Okay, so let's fix all these usages first. So lifts will definitely not have roll. That would be weird. So zero for that. And then the bogies should also also have none. Wait. Yep. And finally, for our current one we're working on, we will have it here. So vehicle dot persistent vehicle data get oscillation car number dot get amount. Perfect. All right. So this amount is a double. We just have to cast it to a float. Let's just make this double and then cast it here. Doesn't really matter. All right, so we've plugged that in. And now finally, we just have to make the vehicle have the movement. So maybe every time it passes over a node or something. So going back to my vehicle simulation code. Let's just yeah, let's just for the sake of testing, instead of this get amount, let's just make it always return, or let's just let's just force it to start oscillation. Vehicle persistent vehicle data get oscillation car number. So we'll force it. Let's say ten degrees. 10 degrees is quite a bit, I guess. 
star oscillation 10 degrees. Okay, let's see how that looks in game. I'm pretty excited because this is all new to me. Oh, look at this. Look at the cable cars and all the trains and the sidings. This looks kind of weird, like it's snapping like that. That's not how it's supposed to look like. Okay, so let's take a look back at the code and see what's going on. Okay, the first thing that's jumping out at me is that my equation here is probably really wrong. So, uh, 2 pi is one period in a sine equation. And so I should be actually dividing time by period and then multiplying it by 2 pi. So, like that. So let's test this first and see how that looks. Okay, still looks a little weird, but I guess better than before. I think because the damping is happening too quickly. So let's try one more thing where we don't change the amplitude at all and see if that makes it look weird still. Yeah, I'm looking at it 0 0.001 is still way too high because like for example millis elapse is like 10 milliseconds, let's say. So e to the power of 10 is already a huge number and then time stamping will probably do nothing. Okay, <laughs> it looks like bobbleheads, but <laughs> that's what that's what it's supposed to look like. Yep, that is a sine function, all right. The cable cars look like they're gonna swing off the cable any second. And the trains just <laughs> look like those tabletop things. What are those called? Looks like those lucky cats things powered by solar panels you see in stores or the Funko Pops, is that what it's called? Okay, so I also noticed that the car connectors, the barriers and the gangways, they don't rotate along with this, which is expected because I didn't code in that. But yeah, this is working as expected. 10 degrees is quite a lot, that's why it looks like it's wobbling a lot, but it's because I put in 10 degrees. Okay, so let's try fixing the amplitude, like the decay, and see how that looks. So I changed the equation a little bit. So if millis elapse is 1000, so one second, the damping would be, and if the damping is set to 1000, so millis elapse over damping will equal to one. So e to the power of 1 will be about 2.7, 2.7182 something, because that's the value of e itself. So the amplitude would decrease by about 2.7 times. So every second, the amplitude would decrease by 2.7 times. Actually, that seems a little too fast also. So maybe I'll make this 2,000. Every 2 seconds, the amplitude will decrease by about... 2.7 times. Okay, I don't know how this will look yet, but let's try it. And then I'll also put some temporary code here that I can only start the oscillation when the amplitude is zero. So then I can actually see the effect of all of this. Okay. They're wobbling and they're supposed to decrease in amplitude, but I don't see that. Is the code not working? Let's try debugging the code. Is it going down at all? So what's the amplitude right now? 6.6 .6 still. Well, as I'm stepping through this, is it going down? Oh, it's 8.6 now. What's going on? Why is it not going down? Hmm. 
Did I change some code earlier that would make it not work? Oh, I think I know why. It's because this scheduled amplitude is always resetting this every time it hits the period. And also, it's my is my code here correct? Time mod period. I guess it's correct. Hmm. All right. Well, we need to add if scheduled amplitude is greater than zero first. Yeah, so every time we set the amplitude, it doesn't get reset again. So let's try that. Oh, that looks good. Okay, so let's see how little the trains will have to keep going. Is it at zero yet? Still moving a very tiny bit. There we go. Kicked off another damping cycle. Okay, that looks quite natural actually. Like if if the magnitude wasn't at 10, but at something less. Yeah, I, I like that. Okay, now I remove my temporary code because we want to be able to start the oscillation at any time. Okay. So, now we need to figure out when to trigger the oscillation. So I'm thinking maybe in the vehicle simulation code, as I mentioned earlier, like when we, when we pass a node, or maybe just at random times. That might work too. So let's just try at random times first. So where's our code for that? Um, wait, actually, we can do the node detection stuff pretty easily. Hmm, wait, how come I suddenly can't find the simulation code? Oh, that's because that code is actually in the base vehicle class, and that's in the transport simulation core. Okay, that's no problem. We can still get the rail progress, right? And and we can get the speed as well. So, so if we want to just do... Speed, if speed is greater than zero, because we don't want it to move when it's, the train is stopped anyway. So persistent vehicle data, get oscillation, car. Wait, hmm. Now the issue is... I feel like... I feel like the main thing that I'm trying to figure out here is how can we... At which points of the movement should we trigger the oscillation? So some options are whenever we go through a junction, whenever the track splits, that's a junction. Or whenever it takes a tight curve, so maybe that can be detected by when we move to the next rail segment, I don't know. Can we get the current path data? Index? No, there's no easy way to grab the index. We can get the rail progress though. Maybe every certain number of blocks in the rail progress, but that's not really consistent either. Hmm. Let me open up the transport simulation core and maybe I can add a method to just detect when it's going over a node. Yeah, so the current index and
if we somehow stored the old index and the new index changes from that, that means we just passed over a node. Okay. Okay, I don't know. Because the advantage of using node detection is that you can have you can have the train shake at the same spot for each car so you can have a nice cascading effect versus if you just do it all random then each car might just shake randomly and it won't look synced up so that's why i want to try to sync it to the rail progress somehow yeah so Trying to detect nodes is probably the best option here. So if the vehicle is moving normally, so we would want to add it somewhere here. And then have the current index be detecting changes. Right, so I'm in this automatic moving like simulation section. So this will give us the path data. And so let me just store that somewhere. This is our current path data. So if the rail progress is greater than path data dot end distance, that means we're just about to go over a node. Okay, so I'm going to call a method for pass node. I guess I don't have to pass in any arguments into that new method. So this will be here. Let me add a like a Java doc. Oops so that I can, people can know what this is. Triggered when a vehicle is moving and passes over a rail node. A node. Okay, so let me build this code and test it. All right, so the build succeeded, as you can see here. The files are copied over. And so, in the vehicle extension, we can override. I'll just do it here, because I like to do all the overridden methods at the top. So, pass node. How come it's not showing up? Oh, it's still indexing. No wonder. Is it done? Pass node. There we go. So super pass node should do nothing because this is empty. So instead of this little chunk right here, I'm going to do it up here instead. So persistent vehicle data get oscillation car oh i just realized that pass node method only runs for the first car so that's also going to uh, that's going to have to change hmm well let's just do car number one first start oscillation Magnitude of 5 degrees. Or right, let's do magnitude of speed. Speed. Okay. So speed. Let me calculate this real quick. So I'm doing some calculation online. And 300 kilometers per hour would only be 0 0.0833 meters per second. Which means meters per millisecond I mean so if I want to get eight degrees of 
movement then I have to times this by 100 or maybe I times it by 50 so to give me like 4 degrees of sway let's see how this looks actually I'm thinking about this a little bit more maybe it'll be better if I don't add this code to the transport simulation core and just add everything on the client side instead since we have access to the immutable path anyway we might as well just try to calculate the rail progress ourselves let me think about that oh wait i think i forgot to take out the code that makes it oscillate all the time <laughs> Where did I do that? Here. Alright. Let's try that again. Alright, cool. Nothing shaking right now. Even the cable cars, I think. I think... Let's take a look at the train. So I'm going to be riding on the first car. And let's see what happens when we go past the node. Yeah, that's not the kind of shaking that we want. Oh, there we go. Next station, Got a little bit of shake. And so that should slowly disappear. Yep, now it's back at zero. Oh, now the first car is going to be on that side. Or maybe it's still going to be on this side. Oh, yep, yeah, there's the shake. Even more shake. Wow. It's like the train's gonna sway off the tracks. But that looks great. I mean, I enjoyed that. I think that looks cool. <laughs> it's definitely something that I'll need to get used to in the mod. But I think that's a great addition overall. Alright, let me try to fix the car index stuff so that I can have it for all the cars as well. Because right now only the first car has this method run. See, none of the other cars are shaking, only the first car was. Alright! Let me go back to the code. This is the code that I've added. So we're going to iterate all the cars of the vehicle and find if the path, find if that car has just passed a rail node or not using the old rail progress, which is saved up at the top of this method and the length so far of the train that we're iterating through. Seems a little bit complicated, I don't want to dive into this too much, but basically this code checks each car to see if each car passes over a node, and I'm running Minecraft right now so that we can test the result. Oh no, nothing's rendering and I'm getting, getting some index out of bound stuff. Okay, let me investigate. So, let's see what's going on. Index is greater, blah blah blah. Okay, so this car number is out of bounds. How come? Immutable vehicle cars get car number. This car number should... Oh, this should be I, not 1. Why did I type 1 here? Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, this should be I. So the size minus i minus 1 is going to be the index we're going to use when the train is currently moving in reverse because the last car is going to be the first to hit the hit the node. So the rail progress will be respective to the last car. That's why we have to reverse the index like that. But this shouldn't be hard coded to 1. It should be the index of the forward index which is from 0 to the size minus 1. Okay, let's try this again. Hopefully it doesn't crash. 
Earlier I was talking about how the oscillation, the period is hard-coded, as well as the damping. I feel like the damping is okay because technically the damping is like the k factor of the spring, like the spring constant in physics, of the bogey attached to the train. And it's okay if we kind of like assume it's all the same between all the different types of trains, but the period being the same will be unrealistic. So instead, when we create this oscillation object, I feel like it would be helpful to pass in also the train length. So when we do a get oscillation here, we add another parameter for the train length and then pass that in somehow. Or maybe just... Where did my code go? Vehicle extension, yeah. So when we get the oscillation and start oscillation, maybe here we can just pass in the vehicle length here. So when we start the oscillation, then the vehicle would move with a different period. Okay. Well, let's see how this currently will work first. Because I don't know... Hmm, we'll just see. I'm going to not ride the train first, just look at it from the outside. Actually, yeah, I'm going to look at the train from the outside. I'm going to stand where there's a node. Oh, there's a train coming from the other side. Oh, you can see it all. Is this slightly different? Okay, let me just get on this train just to look. Why isn't this train moving? Is it waiting for another train over there? Or maybe this train is early, that's why it's waiting here. Okay, let's just uh, refresh the depot so that I can take a better look. Train is going to go through here. I guess it's really hard to tell, yeah. It's quite hard to tell just by looking. Okay. This will give me a clear view of the movement. Oh, it's already swaying a little bit, you can see. Ooh. I can't tell... Oh, it looks like it's all in sync. Maybe because it's just moving over the nodes too quickly. Can't really tell that it's different. Like, each car is moving differently. We'll see when we go back over the other node. When this car starts to move... Next station, test at... Yeah, slightly different. Can you can you tell? Maybe I'll slow down the train a little bit. I think right now I've I've been testing the acceleration and it's been unrealistically high. So let me try clearing that first, and then taking a look at the train here. So after it passes this first node. It should start... wait. Oh, it's really hard to tell. Let's go ride the train. I slowed down the train, so the acceleration should be pretty low. So we should be able to see the difference in the movement. And I've also intentionally made the player not move with the motion so it feels like the train is moving rather than the player oh yep i saw the second car sway while the first car stayed still that's because we passed over the node too quickly well that looks almost the same slightly different see Kind of hard to tell with these closed gangways. 
Alright, I'm gonna get out of the train and try to ride one of the back cars. Oh no! <laughs> Missed the train. I don't think I can really tell from here either. Oh, you see my signals? That's the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about, but I didn't want to show you too early. But I guess I kind of did. I'm not going to go over there for now because the signals are like the next secret that I was going to share with you all. Let's wait for the next train first though, so that we can see the shaking first. Okay. Uh, let's go like over here so we can see a few cars at once. So it's going at a slow speed right now. Let's wait till the car goes over the node. Oh yeah? It's swaying a little bit differently from the car in front of it. And also, yeah, the connector isn't moving with the train right now. Okay, I think basically I've got it, I think, right? I've gotten the base functionality to work. I'm really happy with that. I think, yeah. Hmm. What else is there to... I don't know. Let's test this one more time. I'm gonna ride the second car. And look this way. So this car should start swaying. Yep. Yeah, you can definitely tell that each car is swaying independently. Alright! Alright, I'm happy with the result. And it looks really good. I'm happy with that. Oh, I'm so excited about this. Cherbert will be happy when he sees this. At least this is the first iteration of the feature, and I can definitely improve on this, like make it sway dependent on the train length and stuff like that. Okay, before I run out of storage space on my computer from recording such a long video, let me show you what's new with signals. So I guess you can already tell by all these random signals lying here when I was testing that you can now place signals in all 16 directions. Before you can only place them like north, south, east, west but now you can place them in 22.5 degree increments like that. And they will detect the appropriate signal direction by the direction you place the signal. So if I place my signal kind of diagonally like this you see the front signal corresponds to this is a little marker to show you which signal line is going to detect. So if I face it at this angle, this signal will point to that light blue one, and this one will point to this orange and pink signal, which is shown on top here as well. Also, uh, let me put it... Yeah, let me show you one more example. If I put it in this direction, you see that this signal, this track has no signal, so there's nothing shown on here, not even a green light, so that's different. While this way is showing blue and orange, which is expected. So no matter what orientation you put your signal in, it will try to logically find the direction of the next track that has signal on it, signal lines on it. I feel like I'm not explaining this very well, but if you play around with it, it will probably be pretty intuitive for you. Okay, the next feature is if you right click on the signal with a brush, right now it's showing pink and orange, right? So I right click on it, right now it's shown as select all, so all colors of signals are used. So if I wanted to only detect if the orange signal is being used and change it to red light if only the orange signal is occupied then I can do that and now it will only detect from the orange signal. It's kind of hard to tell right now because pink and orange are such similar colors but orange is shown here as the bigger square and pink is just shown as a faint line to show that pink is available as a signal that's detected but it's not being shown on the signal itself. 
But since orange is also occupied right now, the light turns red. So let's say if I don't do orange, I do green instead. There's no green signal here to be found, so both orange and pink have not are not being used as the signal light. So it's going to be green because this green signal is not occupied because it's not even there. So it's going to be a green light. But if I check the pink one as well, the pink is occupied. And even though the green is non-existent, there's still pink and so it'll turn red, red light. And when the train, this train leaves, the pink, yeah, this light turns green again. Okay, so those are the signal updates. This works for the semaphore as well, it's the same concept. And you can also see a little preview at the top here. That preview only shows if you're holding a signal or the brush or rail related item. Otherwise, the signals will render like normal and it won't show the little flashy boxes to show you what colors are available. Okay, and there's also select all. If you click this, then it'll just show all of the signals. Same behavior as the old versions of the mod. All right, so I think that's all for today. I've done a lot of coding today. The signals, the f like the angled signals, and then the signal filtering, and then also the train swaying, that's a secret feature for Cherbert. And I hope he enjoys the feature. And I hope you all enjoyed the video and are excited about the 4.0 update. Remember that you can always try out new features using the test server. Check out my other video for that if you want a refresher on how to join that test server. I'm going to need a little bit more time to release the signals onto the test server because the add-ons will need to be updated as well because there's so many code changes that the add-ons will need to be updated also. So remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time. Bye!